Is my MySQL server configured properly? Should I run Community MySQL, MariaDB, Percona, or WebScale SQL? How many InnoDB buffer pool instances should I run? How do I size the InnoDB log file size? And what is that InnoDB log anyway? These and many more questions will be answered shortly. Hi, my name is Armas Mikalauskas. I am a former Percona performance consultant and architect, currently writing, consulting, and teaching at speedemy.com. I have started using MySQL in 1999 with version 3.23, and in just a few years, around 2004, I got an opportunity to work as a consultant on scaling the five fastest growing websites in Lithuania at that time. In December 2006, I have joined Percona as their first consultant, where I spent over nine years working with hundreds of companies, helping them fine-tune, optimize, and scale their database systems and designing large-scale online applications. Companies such as BBC, Engine Yard, various social networks, and small shops like Estante Virtual, PineCov, VXP Co. IL, and many others. In this video, you will learn all there is to learn about tuning MySQL configuration file for best performance. After you're done watching, assuming you watch it till the very end, you will know exactly which settings you need to tweak on freshly installed server, or one you've been running for years and what to change when you upgrade your server with more CPUs, more memory, faster magnetic disks, SAN, or a brand new SSD disk, and where to look next. Here's how this is going to be structured. We will begin with a discussion on different MySQL distributions, so you know which distribution you should use for which project. Next, I will introduce you to the essentials of MySQL configuration tuning, most common mistakes I've seen and done myself during these 12 years and best practices, including how to apply the changes and see the effects. Then we will look at 17 key MySQL settings when it comes to performance. And finally, as a bonus, I will show you how to make sense of various ways to look at MySQL status counters and gauges. Enjoy! First let's talk about the number of different MySQL distributions that are available these days. There's the Oracle Community MySQL, Percona Server, MariaDB, and WebScale SQL. Let's quickly discuss what they have in common and what are the key differences so you know when to use which. It's very important to note that as long as you're using the same major version, you can use most of them interchangeably. You don't need to do migration or even upgrades for your tables. You can just stop the server, switch the binaries, and run the different version using the same data directory. Your application won't notice the difference, well, at least from the functionality point of view. Let's talk each of the MySQL versions real quick. Community MySQL This is the Oracle developed MySQL that, in my view, receives the most development efforts. It is also the version that is used as an upstream for all of the other MySQL versions. We'll talk about how each of them is using the upstream in each section separately. In terms of performance, there are a few important things to know. Community MySQL 5.1 does not have InnoDB plugin enabled by default. So if you run with default configuration, you will have a very poor performance at scale and you also will be missing out on a lot of features. That's not to say you should be using Phi1 at all, but if you are currently, beware that the very first thing you could do to take its performance to the next level is enable the InnoDB plugin. Community MySQL 5.5 already has strengthened InnoDB at its core. However, there's still lots of performance improvements as well as features missing that you could find in appropriate Percona server with ExtraDB and MariaDB with ExtraDB versions, especially when it comes to stability at high write rates. Other than that, you can get pretty far with MySQL 5.5 as your base server. Community MySQL 5.6 got a lot of new features and performance improvements including optimizer improvements, a number of new mutexes that were introduced to alleviate contention on the kernel mutex, performance schema improvements, multi-threaded purge threads, separate flush thread, and so on and so forth. At this release, there are even fewer reasons to use an alternative version such as Percona or MariaDB, and we'll talk about them in the appropriate sections. Community MySQL 5.7 
the newest MySQL GA release yet, is currently the server with most features, including such new features like multi-source replication, JSON support, proper multi-threaded replication, online buffer pool resize, spatial data types or InnoDB, C schema, and so on and so forth. Also, according to Oracle's benchmarks, it is the best performing MySQL server that's currently available in the market. Beware that some vendors have attempted to manipulate benchmark results, showing better performance on their versions by using a different default configuration. So do not be confused by that. I took a bit more time talking about Community MySQL because it's used at the core of most of the other server variants. To explain what I mean by that, let me now switch to Percona Server. Percona Server was originally launched around July 2008 when we started releasing our builds of MySQL 5.0 and 5.1 with few additional patches, microsecond resolution slow query log, execution plan details, additional InnoDB statistics, and user statistics patch from Google. Although it wasn't called Percona Server back then yet, it was called simply Percona Patches for MySQL. Unofficially, however, Percona has been building patched versions of MySQL for their customers even earlier, in addition to slow query log details that helped us as consultants understand better what is happening inside the server, those were also various performance fixes. We always followed one simple rule. Use the latest upstream community MySQL, remove any redundant features that are now implemented properly in MySQL, and never break backwards compatibility. Meaning that if you run Percona Server 5.173, you should be able to switch back to MySQL 5.173 by simply swapping the binaries. There were a few exceptions to that, like with additional rollback segments for extremely write-heavy databases, which, if enabled, didn't allow downgrade. However, in all of these cases, Percona made it very clear, I mean, danger in capital red clear, that these changes are not backwards compatible, and they were never enabled by default and none of these incompatible changes are available in either 5.5, 5.6 or 5.7 versions of Percona server. So, in a nutshell, if you are running MySQL 5.6.28 and you want to try out Percona server, just remove community MySQL 5.6.28, install Percona server 5.6.28 and if you don't like something, you can switch back to community edition the same way. It's just a matter of stopping one version and starting the other. Now, in terms of performance, here's a few interesting things. If you are running MySQL 5.1, do upgrade to Percona Server 5.1. You will be amazed how much better it is. On Percona Server, you don't need to enable the InnoDB plugin. It will be enabled by default. But it has an enormous amount of performance and especially scalability improvements. Plus, you will have all the additional features that showed up in MySQL only in versions 5.5 and 5.6. Percona Server 5.5 still has a great advantage over MySQL 5.5. Adaptive hash index partitions, faster checksums, buffer pool scalability improvements, much better adaptive flushing algorithm, plus a number of additional plugins that are otherwise only available in enterprise MySQL, such as PAM authentication, InnoDB table import, audit log, and thread pool. So it's both more stable and more scalable. Percona Server 5.6 has the same benefits of version 5.5, and it has a few performance improvements. But the difference over MySQL 5.6 is now only visible with high-end hardware, super-fast flash storage, hundreds of gigabytes of RAM, and tens of CPU cores. At this time, Percona Server 5.7 is not yet generally available. However, I would only expect Percona Server to make a difference with edge cases, and for most common, even high-performance workloads, MySQL 5.7 may be good enough for you. One other big advantage of Percona Server I didn't talk much about is the enhanced slow query log. For me, it is the top reason why I run Percona Server everywhere I can. Just by using the slow query log, I can get such an enormous amount of information about the queries that I pretty much don't need any other statistics from MySQL. 
But since this is not a query optimization course, let's now talk MariaDB. MariaDB is a fork of MySQL created by Monty Videnius, the original author of MySQL. It is now adopted by many Linux distributions, and while it's a good MySQL replacement in many aspects, in my view it's slightly overappreciated. If you have ever been to Monty's talk, you know he's focusing his marketing efforts on making Oracle look bad, while many of the things he has been manipulating never became true. Anyways, politics aside, let's talk about two versions of MariaDB, MariaDB 5.5 and MariaDB 10. Maria 5.5 is using MySQL 5.5 at its core, plus it adds the ExtraDB storage engine, a replacement for InnoDB adopted from Percona server, and some code from MariaDB 5.3, which has a number of query optimization improvements, multi-master replication, group commit fix, and a few other features. So, if you are using 5.5 branch, with some specific query types, you will see benefits by upgrading to MariaDB 5.5. MariaDB 10, on the other hand, is very different from all of the other variants of MySQL in that it has started diverging from the upstream MySQL. It is what would be called a real fork, rather than a spoon. MariaDB used MySQL 5.6 at its foundation, but you should expect that MariaDB will not be backwards compatible with MySQL 5.6, 5.7 or any later MySQL versions. Most noticeable new features of MariaDB are parallel replication, multi-source replication, Cassandra, Spider and TokuDB storage engines. The adaption of MariaDB is very limited so far, and there aren't any good quality benchmarks comparing MySQL 5.6 or 5.7 to MariaDB 10, except for the ones produced by MariaDB, which are potentially biased, so it's too early to say if it's better to switch to MariaDB 10 or stay on MySQL. However, given the amount of development resources MySQL is getting and the vast improvements in MySQL 5.7, my recommendation is to stay on MySQL rather than MariaDB for now. Finally, let's discuss the last player in the field, WebScale SQL. WebScale SQL is a collaboration amongst engineers from several companies that face similar challenges in running MySQL at scale, namely Alibaba, Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, and Twitter. It is a MySQL fork using MySQL 5.6 at its core, and as far as I'm aware, there are no plans to use MySQL 5.7, as they consider 5.6 a good enough version to use as a basis. However, it is also not planning to diverge from MySQL upstream, even though some features might make your data files not MySQL 5.6 backwards compatible. Oh, and also, the coolest stuff is backported from MySQL 5.7 when needed. It's very important to mention that, unlike other variants mentioned earlier, WebScale SQL serves a very special purpose. It's not meant to be used as a general purpose MySQL server. Rather, it addresses very specific needs of the named companies running MySQL at scale. Well, scale with a capital S. So, unless you are running at least few tens of MySQL servers, you may wait a little on optimizing to that degree. Here's just a few things that are different on WebScale SQL things that other variants don't and may not even have plans to have for quite obvious reasons. Ability to specify millisecond timeouts for various network operations. Super read-only mode. Ability to disable deadlock detection, not something you want to run on a typical transactional database server. Prefix index query optimization. Absence of performance schema by default. Apparently, performance schema may have a noticeable overhead, even when not enabled. InnoDB flushing performance fixes, most of which are also available in Percona server, MariaDB, and now MySQL 5.7. You can find the full list of extensive details in the following blog post by my former colleague Lorinas on Percona blog. So, you can see that unless you know exactly what you're doing, some features are potentially dangerous to run with. Therefore, if you're in doubt, 
stick to Percona server, MariaDB or StockMask 5.7 until you are absolutely sure WebScale SQL is what you need. Now let's start with the essentials of MySQL performance optimization, namely MySQL configuration for high performance. Here's a fact. MySQL defaults are poor. Yes, you can start MySQL with no configuration and you can start using it for development right away. However, you can't just put MySQL with default configuration to production and expect that it will handle the increasing workload with ease. You have to prepare your server for that. There's still good news though. First, MySQL 5.7 has better defaults than ever before. And second, MySQL is very easy to configure. It's just one configuration you have to deal with, my.cnf, and it has one option per line, so the format is very convenient. The location of MySQL configuration file may be different across different operating systems and distributions. However, on Linux it's typically either Etsy MySQL, Red Hat style, or Etsy MySQL, my.cnf, Debian style. On Windows, it's going to be the data directory. Open that file, as we'll need it real soon. Or create it if it's not there yet. Oh, and note that on some systems, you would typically already have the default configuration file, so you may need to do some merging in the editing process and remove some options that are apparently not necessary. I would like to start with the most common mistakes when configuring MySQL as these are very, very common. During the last nine years I've spent at Procona working as a MySQL performance and scalability consultant, I found that customers often use the trial and error approach when tuning MySQL configuration. They change a few things and check if it feels better. And this is the biggest mistake that I've seen being done when approaching MySQL configuration. Problem is that by the time you're measuring how your application feels, situation may have changed already. Plus, you have to consider the warm-up time and disregard any overhead you see due to it. And most importantly, you can't actually base your optimization efforts on feelings. It's either faster, more scalable, and you understand why, or it's not. After such a tuning session, you may end up with a worse configuration that you have started with. In fact, more often than not, that's exactly what I would find when a customer would first contact me. So please, don't do it. Understand exactly what it is that you're changing and only change it when you know that is exactly what you need. Most important variables to performance will be discussed here, so you have a good opportunity to learn this and avoid this most critical mistake. Now, here's a few other common errors using Google for performance advice. Never trust the first response you find on Google when searching for a performance advice or a value for your specific variable. A lot of the advice on the internet is very generic and often lacks context. For example, you may find a lot of configuration files on the internet that were used for benchmarks. However, benchmarks often intentionally do certain things that should not be done on production servers, such as disabling double write buffer setting InnoDB thread concurrency to zero, and similar. Also, a lot of the settings are hardware dependent, which is why it's even more so important to understand what it is that a specific variable is doing exactly. Obsessing about fine-tuning the MyCNF. Don't get obsessed about fine-tuning the configuration. Usually, 10-15 variables will give you the most impact and fine-tuning the variables is highly unlikely to have any additional benefits. It can do harm though. If you still have a performance problem even after you have applied all the recommendations and gotten rid of everything that you shouldn't have touched in the first place, the problem is probably somewhere else. Bad queries, lack of resources, etc. Changing many things at once. When working with a configuration file, change only one thing at a time especially if you already have a solid configuration. Otherwise, when things go east, it may be very hard or even impossible to figure out which setting could have caused the issue. So you will have to roll back all of the changes and then start one by one anyway. If it's a new setup or you were running with default configuration until now, 
feel free to go wild and implement all of the changes recommended here at once. Otherwise, change one thing and take some time to monitor the server after the change. Keep MyCNF in sync with the changes you make. It's no secret that many things can now be changed online without even touching MyCNF. Even the InnoDB buffer pool size can be changed online in MySQL 5.7. That's very convenient, but make sure you update MyCNF after you're done with the changes or you will lose all of the changes when MySQL is restarted and you'll have to start over. Redundant entries in MyCNF If you use the same variable twice, MySQL will not complain about it. In most cases, it will just use the latest value found for the same variable. So be sure you don't add the same variable twice, otherwise you may end up not seeing the impact. Also note that a dash and an underscore can be used interchangeably. So InnoDB log file size with dashes between words and InnoDB log file size with underscores between words are both referring to the same server setting. Multiplying buffer sizes. When you add more memory to the server, don't just multiply the size of all buffers in effect. Some buffers are local, some global. Some are storage engine related, some are server wide. In fact, there are very few variables that you need to increase in size as you add more memory. Yes, these are crucial to update, or you won't have the desired effect, but only these and no other. I will talk about these variables as we progress. Using the wrong MyCNF section. While MySQL configuration file is simple, it's important to mention that it does have sections, and these are important. For example, such sections as MySQL client, MySQL D safe, and there's also MySQL D section, which is exactly the section you must use if you want server configuration to take effect. So all of the variables for server configuration should be placed after MySQL D and before the next section begins. The only exception here is if you're using the MySQL D multi script, in which case you'll be working with several sections rather than just one. Changing configuration online. Like I mentioned earlier, there is a way to change some parameters online. And in fact, it's safe to try even if you're not sure if you can change it online. MySQL will just tell you that the variable is read only meaning that you should be changing the mycnf file instead and restarting the server. Here's how I would change InnoDB buffer pool size to 128 megabytes online on MySQL 5.7. Except that this is MySQL 5.6, which is why I did not succeed. How about InnoDB thread concurrency? Let's change that, but first let's check the current value for it. It's 0. Let's change it to 8. This time we succeed. And in addition to the syntax of changing the configuration, you can see how you can access a value of a single global configuration variable. Which brings me to the next section. Global versus local variables. We have just seen a way to alter global MySQL configuration. But here's an interesting thing. Quite often, you don't need to update the global configuration just to get the single query work properly. In fact, very often it's better that you leave the global configuration untouched, because an optimization for one query may affect all of the other queries in a negative way. For example, one of the things I recommend is to keep the sort buffer size at its default value, because otherwise a full buffer is allocated for any session where sorting is done and that may end up wasting a lot of memory and time allocating it. But what do you do if you have a query that is consistently sorting large amounts of data and you can't add an efficient index, but you also want to avoid disk-based sorts? Or what if you have a query that's constantly using index merge intersection optimization and you know it would be much better off not using it? In that case, just set a session variable prior to running that query by issuing a statement similar to this one. This will only change the value and behavior for this session. 
17 key MySQL variables. And now let's get down to business. Let's talk about the 17 MySNF settings that are key for optimal MySQL performance. I have also prepared a special ready to use in production MySNF file that includes all of these 17 variables with short explanations and links to appropriate sections on my blog with more verbose explanations. You can download it by going to speedami.com slash 17. Basically, you can use this file as a starting point for your production server by tweaking one or two settings where appropriate. Now, here's the few MySQL settings we should talk about. Default Storage Engine If all of your MySQL tables are using InnoDB and you don't need convincing that InnoDB is the way to go, you're all set with this one. If you're unsure, however, bear with me, we have some ground to cover. MySQL has supported pluggable storage engines since its inception over 20 years ago, but for a very long time, MyISM was the default storage engine, and many people running MySQL didn't even know anything about the underlying storage engines. After all, MySQL was originally designed to be a small practical database for small websites and many applications got into habit of using MyISM storage engine explicitly. This seemed like a good idea first, but here's the problem. MyISM was not designed with highly concurrent workload number of CPU cores and RAID areas in mind. And it was never meant to be resilient either. So as websites started getting more traffic, they could no longer scale because MySQL queries would spend seconds waiting on table level locks, the only locking mechanism that MyISAM supports. And they didn't want to be losing their business critical data on each MySQL crash either. What many people don't know, though, is that virtually for as long as MySQL existed, MyISAM storage engine had a cousin called InnoDB. And highly concurrent workload, performance, and resilience, also atomicity, consistency, and isolation, was exactly where InnoDB shined. Sure, it had a few bumps as it was growing up, most notably scalability issues before version 5.0.30. But over the last nine years, InnoDB has been improved in all areas you can and can't imagine, whereas MySAM got virtually no attention at all. Therefore, as of MySQL 5.5.5, InnoDB became the default storage engine, and nowadays you will hardly find a sizable MySQL installation that's still using MySAM and not InnoDB. Now, before we go any further, let me show you how you can quickly get a count and list of MySAM tables on your system so you can start planning your migration. Here's a really cool query that shows the storage engines you are using and a number of tables using each storage engine. You can fetch this query from the ebook you will get at the link I mentioned earlier. Oh, I didn't mention you will get an ebook. Well, consider yourself warned. So go to speedemy.com slash 17 to download both my CNF file and the ebook where you can pick up all the queries that I will mention on this video. On the screen you can see that this particular customer had 13 my SAM tables holding over 7 gigabytes worth of data combined. And if you find yourself in a similar situation, don't worry, we'll fix that soon. To get a list of all my SAM tables sorted by size, just run this query. Bear in mind that changing the default storage engine setting to InnoDB or upgrading MySQL doesn't automatically convert all your tables to InnoDB. Far from it. You actually have to go and convert tables one by one or have a script do it. Now before you go on and convert just the big ones to InnoDB, here's something really important. Sometimes, as part of migration to InnoDB, DBAs start with the large MySAM tables to see if things will get better. Sometimes it helps, but in many cases it doesn't. Here's the problem. If at least one table in a join is MySAM, the entire query is using table level locks. So, having even a small MySAM table in a large join can be very bad for concurrency. 
So when you're ready to convert, make sure to convert all my SAM tables to UniDB, not just the big ones. I recommend that you hold off with conversion for now until you understand InnoDB configuration better. But when you're ready, you can run the following query to get a list of queries that will convert all tables in a given schema from MySAM to InnoDB. In the beginning, I mentioned that many applications are using MySAM explicitly. What I mean by that is that during the initialization of the database, when all tables are created, Create table statements often have engine equals myisam set at the end. So tables are created as myisam regardless of your default storage engine setting. So it's a good idea to check for any myisam tables every now and then. And if you're using Percona server, you may also want to set the following in my CNF. InnoDB buffer pool size. This is the most important InnoDB variable. Actually, if you're using InnoDB as your main storage engine, for you, it's the most important variable for the entire MySQL server. Computers use most of their memory to improve access to most commonly used data. This is known as caching, and it is a very important part of computing, because accessing data on a disk can be 100 to 100,000 times slower, depending on the amount of data being accessed. Just think of it. A report that takes one second to generate when all data is in memory could take over a day to generate if all data had to be read from disk every single time, assuming also random I.O. MySum is using OS file system cache to cache the data that queries are reading over and over again, whereas InnoDB uses a very different approach. Instead of relying on operating system to do the right thing, InnoDB handles caching itself within the InnoDB buffer pool. And throughout this video, you will learn how it works and why it was a good idea to implement it that way. InnoDB buffer pool actually serves multiple purposes. It's used for data caching. This is definitely the big part of it. Indices caching. Yes, these share the same buffer pool. Buffering. Modified data, often called dirty data, lives here before it's flushed. Storing internal structures. Some structures such as adaptive hash index, we'll get to it later, or row locks are also stored in the InnoDB buffer pool. Here's a very typical InnoDB buffer pool page distribution from a customer machine with InnoDB buffer pool size set to 62 gigabytes. As you can see, buffer pool is mostly filled with regular InnoDB pages, but about 10% of it is used for other purposes. Oh, and in case you're wondering what units are used in this graph, that's InnoDB pages. A single page is typically 16 kilobytes in size, so you can multiply these numbers by 16,384 to get a sense of usage in bytes. So what should InnoDB buffer pool size be set to? I'm glad you asked. I was just about to get there. On a dedicated MySQL server running all InnoDB, as a rule of thumb, recommendation is to set the InnoDB buffer pool size to 80% of the total available memory on the server. Why not 90% or 100%? Because other things need memory too. Every query needs at least few kilobytes of memory, and sometimes few megabytes. There's various other internal MySQL structures and caches. InnoDB has a number of structures using memory beyond the buffer pool. Dictionary cache, file system, lock system, and page hash tables, etc. There's also some MySQL files that must be in OS cache. Binary logs, relay logs, InnoDB transaction logs. Plus, you want to leave some room for the operating system memory structures. By the way, this number is not pulled out of the hat. I've seen hundreds of systems, large and small, and even on the servers with 512 gigabytes of RAM, we found 80% to be about the right size for the sustainable operation. If you see a lot of free memory, sure, you can bump it up a bit, especially as MySQL 5.7 makes this much easier, but do not let MySQL consume all memory, or you will face problems, big problems, namely swapping. Swapping is the worst thing that can happen to a database server. It's much worse than having buffer pool size that's not large enough. 
One example how this may go wrong is InnoDB using a lock that it typically uses when accessing a page in memory, 100 nanoseconds access time, to access the page that is swapped out, 10 milliseconds access time. This would cause all currently running queries to stall. And as these things usually don't walk alone, you can guess where this is going. If your MySQL server shares resources with application, rules of thumb no longer work. In such an environment, it's much harder to find the right number. On the other hand, it's usually less so important to find the right size, and a good enough number is often good enough in a shared environment. In any case, first I check the actual size of the InnoDB tables. Chances are, you don't really need much memory. Remember this query from the earlier segment? This will give you an idea how much memory you'd need for InnoDB buffer pool if you wanted to cache the entire dataset. And note that in many cases you don't need that much, you only want to cache your working set, actively used data. If it all fits in, say, half the memory in the server, great, set it to the size of all of the InnoDB tables combined and forget it for some time. If not, let me teach you a very simple trick to determine if the InnoDB buffer pool is well sized. Using a server command line, run the following. What you see here is the number of reads from disk into the buffer pool per second. These numbers above are pretty darn high. Luckily, the server has an IO device that can handle around 4000 random IO operations per second. And if this was an OLTP system, I would highly recommend to increase the InnoDB buffer pool size and add more memory to the server if needed. If you don't have access to the command line, I suggest you get one, as you're a lot more flexible there. But if you want a graphical user interface alternative, MySQL Workbench is your friend. Under Performance, open the Dashboard, and you will see both InnoDB buffer pool reads and also InnoDB disk reads. Finally, here's how you actually change the InnoDB buffer pool size. If you're already on MySQL 5.7, you are extremely lucky, because that means you can change it online. Just run the following command as a super user, and you're done. Well, not exactly done. You still need to change it in mice and a file too. But at least you will not need to restart the server, as the InnoDB buffer pool size will be resized automatically with something along the lines in the error log. All earlier versions of MySQL do require a restart, so 1. Set an appropriate InnoDB buffer pool size in MySQL. 2. Restart MySQL server. 3. Celebrate improved MySQL performance. InnoDB log file size. This sets the size of InnoDB's redo log files, which in MySQL world are often called simply transaction logs. And right until MySQL 5.6.8, the default value of InnoDB log file size, which was 5 megabytes, was the single biggest InnoDB performance killer. Starting with MySQL 5.6.8, the default was raised to 48 megabytes, which for many intensive systems is still way too low. Anyways, let's talk a little about the InnoDB log file size so we have a better understanding of what it is, how MySQL is using it, and how you would have to tune it. Have you ever used an undo or redo function in a word processor, image editor, or virtually any editor for that matter. I'm sure you have. Well, guess what? Transactional databases have exactly the same thing. Well, not exactly, but the principles are the same. And just like it's important for you to always have the ability to go back a few steps in your editing process, so are the undo and redo functions important for a transactional database system. Why? Two reasons primarily. One, rolling back a transaction. That's the undo. Two, replaying committed transactions in case of a database crash. And that's the redo. Here's how it works. Undo. When you are using a transactional storage engine, say InnoDB, and you modify a record, the changes are not written to data file directly. First, they are written to a special file on disk called transaction log. And at the same time, they are also modified in memory the InnoDB buffer pool. This new InnoDB page that contains your modified record is now called dirty. The original unmodified page is copied to a special area on disk called rollback segment. So far so good? 
Now, if someone or something interrupts a transaction with a rollback before it's committed, undo operation needs to occur. Your record has to be restored to its original state. As the changes weren't written to the data files yet, this is pretty trivial. InnoDB just takes the old copy of the page from the rollback segment, wipes the dirty page from the memory, and marks in a transaction log that the transaction was rolled back. So there you go. Data file was never modified, and it's a good thing that it wasn't, because you have cancelled any changes you made before even issuing a random write operation to flush that dirty page to disk. Redo. When you commit the transaction, however, and InnoDB approves your commit, that is, it returns from the commit call, changes are ready to be written to the actual data files. You'd think they are written to disk immediately at this point, but that's not what happens. Why? Because doing so would be very inefficient. Instead, the changes are only written to the transaction log. This is very efficient sequential activity called redo logging. While the modified record still lives in memory, in the InnoDB buffer pool as a dirty page, for as long as time comes to flush it. Crash! MySQL just crashed! Guess what happens now? Well, if InnoDB had no redo log and it only kept dirty pages in memory, all of the committed transactions that were not flushed to disk yet would be gone forever. Quite a disaster if you consider that one of these transactions may have been salary transfer from a company account to yours. Luckily, the changes are always written to the transaction log, also known as redo log, before the operations return from the call. So all InnoDB needs to do is find the last checkpoint in the redo log, position that's been synchronized to disk, and redo all of the modifications by rereading the to be modified data from disk and rerunning the same changes. Easy peasy, right? Well, right, but only on the surface. Underneath, there's a lot of really complex stuff happening that you probably don't want to know about right now. We can talk about it sometime later. One thing you may want to know about, though, is how to size the InnoDB log file size properly. The rules are actually pretty simple. Small log files make writes slower and crash recovery faster. Large files make writes faster and crash recovery slower. Writes become slow with small redo log because the transaction logs act as a buffer for writes. And if you have a lot of writes, MySQL will be unable to flush the data to disk fast enough, so write performance degrades. Large log files, on the other hand, give you a lot of room that can be used before flushing needs to happen. That in turn allows InnoDB to fill the pages more fully. For example, when you modify few records that are on the same page, or in fact, modify the same record several times. And also, in case of magnetic drives, flush the dirty pages in a more sequential order. As for the crash recovery, larger redo log files means more data to be read and more changes to be redone before the server can start, which is why it makes crash recovery slower. Finally, let's talk how you can figure out the right size for the redo logs. Luckily, you don't have to come up with the size that's exactly right. Here's the rule of thumb that we found to work like magic. Check that the total size of your redo logs fits in one to two hours worth of writes during your busy period. How do you know how much InnoDB is writing? Here's one way to do it. In this case, based on 60 second sample, InnoDB is writing 2.6 gigabytes per hour. So, if InnoDB log files in group was not modified, by default it is 2, which is the minimum number of redo log files that InnoDB needs, then by setting InnoDB log file size to, say, 2560 megabytes, you will have exactly 5 gigabytes of redo log storage across the two redo log files. How hard it will be to change the InnoDB log file size and how large you can set it to depends greatly on the version of MySQL or Percona or MariaDB server that you are using. Specifically, if you are using version prior to 5.6, you can't simply change the variable and expect that the server will restart. In fact, it will stop, but won't start. Funny, I know. 
So here's how you have to do it. One, change InnoDB log file size in MyCNF. Two, stop MySQL server. Three, ensure MySQL had a clean shutdown. Four, remove all log files. Five, start MySQL server. It should take a bit longer to start because it is going to be creating new transaction log files. Final thing you should be aware of is that until quite recently, uh, that is until MySQL version 5.6.2, the total redo log size across all redo log files was limited to 4 gigabytes, which was quite a significant performance bottleneck for write-intensive SSD-backed MySQL servers. Percona Server, on the other hand, supports 512 gigabytes since like Percona Server 50 something. In other words, before you set InnoDB log file size to 2 gigabytes or more, check if the version of MySQL you are running actually supports it. InnoDB Flush Log at Transaction Commit By default, InnoDB Flush Log at Transaction Commit is set to 1, which instructs InnoDB to flush and sync after every transaction commit. And if you are running auto commit, then every single insert, update, or delete statement is a transaction commit. Sync is an expensive operation, especially when you don't have a non-volatile write-back cache, as it involves the actual synchronous physical write to the disk. So whenever possible, I would recommend to avoid using this default configuration. Two alternative values for this variable are 0 and 2. 0 means flush to disk, but do not sync. No actual IO is performed on commit. 2 means don't flush and don't sync. Again, no actual IO is performed on commit. So if you have it set to 0 or 2, sync is performed once a second instead. And the obvious disadvantage is that you may lose last second worth of committed data. Yes, you read that right. Those transactions would have committed, but if the server loses power, those changes never happened. Obviously, for financial institutions such as banks, it's a huge no-go. Most websites, however, can and do run with InnoDB flush log at transaction commit equals 0 or 2 and have no issues even if the server crashes eventually. After all, just a few years ago, many websites were using MyISAM, which will lose up to 30 seconds worth of written data in case of crash, not to mention the crazy slow table repair process. Finally, what's the practical difference between 0 and 2? Well, performance-wise, the difference is negligible, really, because a flush to OS cache is cheap, read fast, so it kind of makes sense to have it set to zero, in which case if MySQL, but not the whole machine, crashes, you do not lose any data, as it will be in OS cache and sync to disk from there eventually. By the way, if you prefer durability over performance and have InnoDB flush log at transaction commit set to one, let me draw your attention to the next variable which is closely related. Sync bin log. A lot has been written about sync bin log and its relationship with InnoDB flush log at transaction commit, but let me simplify it for you for now. If your MySQL server has no slaves and you don't do backups, set sync bin log to zero and be happy with a good performance. If you do have slaves and you do backups, but you don't mind losing a few events from the binary log in case of a master crash, you may still want to use seeing bin log zero for the sake of a better performance. If you do have slaves and or backups and you do care about slaves consistency and or point in time recovery, ability to restore your database to a specific point in time by using your latest consistent backups and binary logs, and you are also running InnoDB flush log at transaction commit equals 1, then you should seriously consider using sync bin log equals 1. Problem is of course that sync bin log equals 1 has a pretty significant price. Now, every single transaction is again synced to disk, to the binary logs. You'd think why not do both sync operations at once? And you'd be right. New versions of MySQL, both 5.6 and 5.7, MariaDB and Procona Server already have a properly working group commit, 
in which case the price for this sync bin log equals one is not that big. But older versions of MySQL have a really significant performance penalty, so be careful with that and watch your disk writes. So far so good? Good. Next, InnoDB flush method. Set InnoDB flush method to O direct to avoid double buffering. The only case you should not use O direct is when it is not supported by your operating system. But if you are on Linux, use O direct to enable direct IO. Direct IO means that InnoDB's read and write calls are bypassing OS cache and are going directly to the IO scheduler to get sent to the disks. Without direct IO, double buffering happens because all database changes are first written to OS cache and then synced to disk. So you end up with the same data in InnoDB buffer pool and in OS cache. Yes, that means in a write intensive environment, you could be losing up to almost 50% of memory, especially if your buffer pool is capped at 50% of total memory. And if not, server could end up swapping due to high pressure on the OS cache. In other words, do set InnoDB flush method equals O direct, please. InnoDB buffer pool instances. MySQL 5.5 introduced buffer pool instances as a means to reduce internal locking contention and improve MySQL scalability. In version 5.5, this was known to improve the throughput to some degree only. However, MySQL 5.6 was a big step up, so while in MySQL 5.5 you may want to be more conservative and have InnoDB buffer pool instances equals 4, on MySQL 5.6 and 5.7 you may go with 18 to 16 buffer pool instances. Your mileage may vary, of course, but with most workloads, that should give you best results. Oh, and obviously, do not expect this to make any difference to a single query response type. The difference will only show with highly concurrent workloads, that is, those with many threads doing many things in MySQL at the same time. InnoDB thread concurrency You may hear very often that you should just set InnoDB thread concurrency equals zero and forget it. Well, that's only true if you have a light or moderate workload. However, if you're approaching the saturation point of your CPU or IO subsystem, and especially if you have occasional spikes when the system needs to operate properly when overloaded, then I would highly recommend to tackle InnoDB thread concurrency. Here's the thing, InnoDB has a way to control how many threads are executing in parallel. Let's call it a concurrency control mechanism. And for the most part, it is controlled by InnoDB thread concurrency. If you set it to zero, concurrency control is off. Therefore, InnoDB will be processing all requests immediately as they come in, and as many as it needs to. That is fine if you have 32 CPU cores and 4 requests. But imagine you have 4 CPU cores and 32 CPU intensive requests. If you let the 32 requests run in parallel, you're asking for trouble. Because these 32 requests will only have 4 CPU cores. They will obviously be at least 8 times slower than usually. In reality, more than 8 times slower, of course. But each of those requests will have its own external and internal locks, which leaves great opportunities for all the queries to pile up. To solve that, you can control how many threads InnoDB allows to execute at any given point in time. Other threads wait in a lined up queue. But it's not a simple first in, first out queue. It's much more interesting than that. Here's how it works. A thread entering an InnoDB queue is given a certain number of tickets, equal to the value of InnoDB concurrency tickets. 500 by default on MySQL 5.5 or earlier, 5000 starting MySQL 5.6. Then it waits in a queue until a slot becomes available for it. Finally, it starts executing. And every time the thread does a certain operation, it loses one ticket and goes through a check for the number of remaining tickets. For example, a thread would lose a ticket every time a row is read, inserted, or updated, and it would lose 300 tickets for a single read of 300 rows. Now here's where it gets interesting. As soon as the thread runs out of tickets, uh, that is the ticket count decreases to zero, the thread is placed at the back of the queue 
and needs to wait until the slot becomes available again. Assuming the current number of running threads is above the value of InnoDB thread concurrency. That way, the number of queries that are executing at any given point is limited, yet long-running queries don't prevent quick queries from entering a queue for a very long time. So you see, we already have two variables, InnoDB thread concurrency, which controls how many threads are allowed to run at the same time, and InnoDB concurrency tickets, which controls how many tickets a thread is given every time it re-enters the queue. There's one more variable related to this, InnoDB thread sleep delay, which has a default value of 10,000 microseconds. This sets how long InnoDB threads sleep before joining the InnoDB queue, thus controlling the concurrency to a certain degree. If you want to change the value for InnoDB thread concurrency, you can do it online by running the following command. For most workloads and servers, 8 is a good start, and then you should only increase it gradually if you see the server keeps hitting the limit while hardware is underutilized. To see where the threads stand at any given moment, run show engine InnoDB status and look for similar line in the row operations section. Both InnoDB concurrency tickets and InnoDB thread sleep delay can also be changed online if you'd like to try out different configuration for these. Skip name resolve. This is a funny one, but I couldn't not mention it, as it's still quite common to see it not being used. Essentially, you want to add skip name resolve to avoid DNS resolution on connection. Most of the time, you will feel no impact when you change this, because most of the time, DNS servers work, they work well, and they also tend to cache results. But when a DNS server will fail, it could be really time consuming to figure out what are those unauthenticated connections doing on your server and why things all of a sudden seem slow. So don't wait until this happens to you. Add this variable now and get rid of any hostname based grants. The only exception here is if you're using host file based name resolution or if your DNS servers will never fail. InnoDB I.O. capacity and InnoDB I.O. capacity max. Here's what these two I.O. capacity settings control in a nutshell. InnoDB I.O. capacity controls how many write I.O. requests per second will MySQL do when flushing the dirty data. InnoDB I.O. capacity max controls how many write I.O. operations per second will MySQL do flushing the dirty data when it's under stress. So first of all, this has nothing to do with foreground reads, once performed by select queries. For reads, MySQL will do the maximum number of I.O. operations per second possible to return the results as soon as possible. As for writes, MySQL has background flushing cycles and during each cycle it checks how much data needs to be flushed and it will use no more than inodb I.O. capacity I.O. operations per second to do the flushing. That also includes change buffer merges. Change buffer is where secondary keys dirty pages are stored until they are flushed to disk. Second, I need to clarify what under stress means. This, what MySQL calls an emergency, is a situation when MySQL is behind with flushing and it needs to flush some data in order to allow for new writes to come in. Then, MySQL will use the InnoDB I.O. capacity max amount of I.O. operations per second. Now here's the $100 question, so what do you set these to? Best solution? Measure random write throughput of your storage and set InnoDB I.O. capacity max to the maximum you could achieve and InnoDB I.O. capacity to 50 to 75% of it, especially if your system is write intensive. Often you can predict how many I.O. operations your system can do, especially if it has magnetic drives. For example, 8 15K disks in RAID 10 can do about 1000 random write I.O. operations per second. So you could have InnoDB I.O. capacity set to 600 and InnoDB I.O. capacity max to 1000. Many cheap enterprise SSDs can do 4000 to 10,000 I.O. operations per second. Nothing bad will happen if you don't make it perfect, but 
Beware that the default values of 200 and 400 respectively could be limiting your write throughput and consequently you may have occasional stalls for the flushing activity to catch up. If that is the case, you are either saturating your disks or you don't have high enough values for these variables. InnoDB stats on metadata. If you're running MySQL 5.6 or 5.7 and you didn't change the default InnoDB stats on metadata value, you're all set. On MySQL 5.5 or 5.1, however, I highly recommend to turn this off. That way commands like show table status and queries against information schema will be instantaneous instead of taking seconds to run and causing additional disk I.O. My former colleague Stefan Cambodon from Percona has written a very good blog post on this. You can find a link to this blog post in the notes. Oh, and note that starting with 5.1.32, this is a dynamic variable, so you don't need to restart MySQL just to disable that. InnoDB buffer pool dump at shutdown and InnoDB buffer pool load at startup. It may seem the two variables are not really performance related, but if you are occasionally restarting your MySQL server, example, to apply configuration changes, they are. When both are enabled, the contents of MySQL buffer pool, more specifically cached pages, are stored into a file upon shutdown. And when you start MySQL, it starts a background thread that loads back the contents of buffer pool and improves the warm-up speed that way up to three to five times. Couple of things. First, it doesn't actually copy the contents of the buffer pool into a file upon shutdown. It merely copies the table space IDs and page IDs, enough information to locate the page on disk. Then, it can load these pages really fast with large sequential reads instead of hundreds of thousands of small random reads. Second, loading of the contents on startup happens in the background. Hence, MySQL doesn't wait until the buffer pool contents are loaded and starts serving requests immediately, so it's not as intrusive as it may seem. Third, starting with MySQL 5.7.7, only 25% of least recently used buffer pool pages are dumped on shutdown, but you have a total control over that. Use InnoDB Buffer Pool Dump PCT to control how many pages, expressed in percents, would you like to be dumped and restored. I vote 75 to 100. And fourth, while MySQL only supports this since MySQL 5.6, in Pocona server, you had this for quite a while now. So if you want to stay on version 5.1 or 5.5, or if you are already using Pocona server, Check these two links that you will find in the notes as well. InnoDB Adaptive Hash Index Parts If you're running a lot of select queries and everything else is perfectly in tune, then Adaptive Hash Index is going to be your next bottleneck. Adaptive Hash Indexes are dynamic indexes maintained internally by InnoDB that improve performance for your most commonly used query patterns. This feature can be turned off with a server restart, but by default it is on and in all versions of MySQL. In most cases, it gives a nice boost to many types of queries, that is, until you have too many queries hitting the database, at which point they start spending too much time waiting on the AHI locks and latches. If you're on MySQL 5.7, you won't have any issues with that. InnoDB Adaptive Hash Index Parts variable is there and it's set to 8 by default. So the Adaptive Hash Index is split into 8 partitions. Therefore, there's no global mutex and you're good to go. All MySQL versions before 5.7, unfortunately, have no control over the number of Adaptive Hash Index partitions. In other words, there's one global mutex protecting the Adaptive Hash Index and with many select queries, you're constantly hitting this wall. So if you're running 5.5 or 5.6 and you have thousands of select queries per second, the easiest solution would be to switch to the same version of Percona server and enable adaptive hash index partitions. The variable in Percona server is called InnoDB adaptive hash index partitions. Query cache type. A lot of people think that query cache is great and you should definitely use it. Well, sometimes it's true, 
sometimes it is useful. But it's only useful when you have a relatively light workload and especially if the workload is pretty much read-only, with very few or virtually no writes. If that's your workload, set query cache type equals on and query cache size equals 256 megabytes and you're done. Note, however, you should never set the query cache size any higher or you will run into serious server stalls due to query cache invalidation. I've seen this happen too many times and until someone figures out a way to split the global query cache mutex, this will not go away. Now, if you have an intensive workload, then I would highly recommend this query cache size tuner written by one of very active MySQL community members, Domas Mirzas. More seriously though, you should not only set the query cache size equals zero, but also it's very important that you set query cache type equals off and restart the server when you do that. This way, MySQL will stop using the query cache mutex for all requests, even those that wouldn't use the query cache anyway. By the way, this works with MySQL 5.5 or newer. You can't really disable the query cache mutex in the earlier versions of MySQL. In Percona server, you can also disable it in version 5.1. So if you're still using the query cache and you shouldn't, make these changes now because your queries are likely already suffering due to the query cache mutex contention. InnoDB checks some algorithm. Most mainstream CPUs nowadays support native CRC32 instructions and MySQL can finally make use of that to improve the speed of calculating the InnoDB checksums significantly. To enable that, set the InnoDB checksum algorithm equals CRC32. This is available since MySQL 5.6. Starting with MySQL 5.7.7, this is set by default. Checksums are calculated every single time a page or log entry is read or written. So this is definitely huge. Oh, and by the way, this is totally safe to change on a server that already has tables created with checksum type InnoDB. In fact, you can change it dynamically, online, while the server is still running. Table Open Cache Instances Starting with MySQL 5.6.6, Table cache can be split into multiple partitions. And if you're running MySQL 5.6 or newer, you should definitely do that. Table cache is where the list of currently opened tables is stored. And the mutex is locked whenever a table is opened or closed. And in fact, in a number of other cases. Even if that's an implicit temporary table. And using multiple partitions definitely reduces potential contention here. I've seen this lock open mutex issue in the wild too many times. Starting with MySQL 578, table open cache instances equals 16 is the default configuration, and I'd say it is a definitely good starting point both on MySQL 56 and 57. InnoDB read IO threads and InnoDB write IO threads. I've placed this last because it's really not as important as it may seem. First of all, your MySQL is likely already using asynchronous I.O., which on Linux is supported since MySQL 5.5. Second, both InnoDB read I.O. threads and InnoDB write I.O. threads are only used for the background activity, such as checkpointing, flushing dirty pages to disk, change buffer merge operations, and sometimes read ahead activity. So, while it's not a key variable to tune, aligning it to the number of bearing disks is still a good idea. So for example, on RAID 10 with 8 disks, you may want to have InnoDB read IO threads equals 8 and InnoDB write IO threads equals 4. If you have an SSD, well, then just have it around 16 to 32. But do not expect much performance difference unless your server is extremely write heavy and disk IO is the bottleneck. And we're done with the variables. I wanted to make all these configuration variables as accessible as possible, so I made a special MyCNF with this recommended configuration and useful comments that will help you fine-tune it for your tastes. Visit speedme.com 17 to download them. It's quite amazing how much you can improve things with small changes over the vanilla MySQL configuration.
But you want to know the real truth? The truth is, we haven't even started. Yes, improving MySQL configuration will impact its performance greatly, and it is surely the foundation of a well-performing MySQL server. However, if you have a server that is otherwise tuned pretty well, you shouldn't expect a few configuration changes to improve things drastically. Most of the time, the real devil is in the queries. Occasionally, I am running free webinars on query optimization and similar topics where you can learn more in-depth about MySQL performance optimization and get your questions answered. Go to speedemy.com slash webinars to see a list of upcoming webinars and sign up. Participation is free of charge, and you can watch a recording later if you sign up. Now, let's move on to the final bonus part of this video. In the early days of MySQL, MySQL status was pretty much the only way to look at MySQL performance. Therefore, it was a pretty common practice among MySQL consultants and support engineers to look at MySQL status to understand what's happening with the server. And even though now there are better ways to look at specific issues, for example, analyze query performance using extended slow query log in Percona server or performance schema starting with MySQL 5.6, MySQL status is still a good way to look at general metrics of the server. However, it is really important to look at it correctly, which is what I want to show you now. In this quick lesson, I'm going to show you how to look at MySQL status the right way we will identify few key status variables to look at and you will learn what free tools you can use to make monitoring MySQL status much easier. How to look at MySQL status. First, let me show you what is the wrong way to look at MySQL status. Run show global status in MySQL console or MySQL admin X in the command line and you will be overwhelmed with huge numbers. These commands will show you the current count for each status variable. Oh, and bear in mind that not all status variables are counters, some are gauges, displaying current value. You will have to look at these separately. So, the right way to look at status variables is over a certain period of time. For example, if you run the following command, you will get a total count for each counter now, followed by a total counter 60 seconds later. Minus C specifies how many iterations to show, hence, in this case, counters will be displayed three times. Now, this is still not very useful, because for most variables you are interested in delta rather than totals, and I will show you two ways to get relative numbers. 1. Add minus R to MySQL admin, and that will show you delta right away. 2. Another more elegant way to get the same data is by using ptmext. Although I should admit, I never use it that way. Instead, I would first write MySQL admin output into a file and then I would read that file with ptmext. This allows me to get a different cut for the same data in MySQL admin.txt file. For example, I can collect 100 samples every one second and then analyze the file with grep to look at gauges and use ptmext to analyze counters. Key MySQL status variables to look at. Now let me list a few variables that are interesting to look at. Beware that we're focusing on performance only, so we will not look at all 400 status counters. I always look at these to understand the workload that server is currently dealing with. This will give you an idea of how many commands per second the server is running at any given point, so you can correlate these to any other counters. Temporary tables. It's always a good idea to see how many temporary tables you have on disk versus total number of temporary tables, so you have to look at the following variables. Note that very often the reason on disk temporary tables are created is not at too small temporary table size. Rather, it's variable size columns that are used in the queries, for example, text or blob columns that can't be used in the fixed size temporary tables. For these, temporary table on disk will be used even if the temporary table will contain a single record. Otherwise, many temporary tables can be avoided by reviewing the queries that create them and fixing inefficient execution plans by either indexes or changes in the queries.
handler counters. These are internal operation counters, often accounting for every single record access. The most interesting ones you want to look at are the following ones. For what they stand for, please have a look at MySQL manual over here. However, these counters are much more interesting to look at when you're analyzing a behavior of a specific query. For example, you want to use session status counters in the following fashion. This will give you a much better understanding of what a specific query is doing internally and potentially how you can optimize it. InnoDB counters InnoDB has plenty of counters to look at. Additionally, you can get a whole lot deeper with show engine InnoDB status command. Here's the most typical things I would look at and why. InnoDB buffer pool pages flushed. This shows the number of pages flushed from buffer pool, which is a good way to monitor flushing activity. InnoDB buffer pool reads. Number of disk I.O. calls to read into the InnoDB buffer pool. See how close that is to how many random reads your disks can actually deliver and compare that to this number. InnoDB data F-Syncs. Number of F-Sync calls executed. See if it's not too high for your hardware. Specifically, look at how many write-i operations can your disks do. InnoDB data pending. These are gauges showing a number of pending F-Sync, read or write calls. And these could potentially show saturated I.O. resources. InnoDB data reads, writes. A number of random read-write disk I.O. operations for data files specifically. InnoDB history list length. Gauge showing a number of transactions that haven't been cleaned up after. InnoDB iBuff merges. Number of insert buffer merge operations. High numbers here could explain intense I.O. spikes. InnoDB log weights. Number of times log buffer was too small. It's a good indicator InnoDB log buffer size needs to be increased. InnoDB LSN current. Number of bytes written to the transaction log. This helps you tune InnoDB redo log files. InnoDB mutex OS weights. If this is high, you could be having internal mutex contention. And by high I mean that if it's few hundred or even close to a hundred. InnoDB rows. Helps you understand internal activity. Number of rows read, inserted, deleted or updated. Because not always one insert will be inserting a single record. InnoDB row lock time. Shows how much time is spent on logical locks. Note that some of these variables are only available in Percona server. If you can't find it on your server, check show engine InnoDB status. It's not as convenient, but that's where you will find everything about InnoDB operation. Now, open stuff. Check these to understand if your file caches are sized decently. Ideally, open tables and open table definitions should not be increasing much or at all. Query cache. You can monitor the query cache activity by looking at queue cache counters. Most important is to compare queue cache hits to com select counter to understand how many select queries out of total are served from the query cache. Although queue cache low mem prunes and queue cache inserts can be just as interesting to understand. Note, however, that even if you do see low mem prunes, do not increase the size of the query cache above 256 megabytes. Select counters. There's a few interesting select counters to look at. Here's what they stand for. Select full join. This shows a number of queries that made a table scan during a join, even if join buffer was used. These could be pretty bad queries in some cases, but sometimes it's also tiny tables that are very fast to join anyway. Select full range join. This shows number of joins that used a range search on a reference table. These aren't common, but they aren't always harmful either. Select range. This is a very common range access pattern used by queries. And it's for your information only. Select range check. Number of joins without keys 
with additional key usage check each time row is read. Good indicator of bad indexing, rarely seen in the wild though. Select scan, table scan on the first or the only table in the join, also shows bad indexing. So if either select full join, select range check or select scan is relatively high, chances are you have a pretty bad indexing and I highly recommend doing a query analysis then. Threads counters. One of these counters is the main indicator of any performance issues in MySQL, and I use it in my troubleshooting practice all the time. Here's what the threads counters show. Threads cached. This is a gauge showing a current number of cached threads. Not super interesting. Threads connected. This shows a number of threads currently connected to the server. A lot of these could be sleeping threads, and sleeping threads are very cheap to have, so don't mind these too much either. Threads created. Uh, this is a counter showing a number of threads created because the number of cached threads wasn't enough. If this is high, consider increasing the thread cache size. And threads running. Finally, this is the most interesting counter of them all. It is a gauge showing a number of threads that are currently executing inside MySQL. They could be doing anything from waiting in the InnoDB queue to committing data to disk, but the key thing is that if this number is occasionally abnormally high, that is larger than the number of CPU cores or disk spindles that you have, you are most likely having pretty serious MySQL performance issue. See the following blog post to learn how you can deal with these. Finally, let's look at some free tools that will make your life better when it comes to MySQL status monitoring. Cacti and Zabbix. If you're not using either of two, I would highly recommend to give it a try. They're both free. However, they are not useful for MySQL monitoring in itself. You need to add some additional templates. Percona has a really nice package for that. PTMext. I have already mentioned PTMext. What I did not mention, however, is how you can get it. Well, you can either install Percona Toolkit, which is now included in a number of distributions too, or you can download PTMext as a standalone command line utility, which is what I often do when doing a consulting gig. In a top, it's a top-like command line tool for monitoring MySQL status with some emphasis on InnoDB. It is a really comprehensive tool and I highly recommend to check it out. That's it for now. Thank you very much for watching. If you found this useful, make sure to subscribe as I have more MySQL related videos and tutorials coming. Oh, and don't forget to share it with your community. This was Armas at speedemy.com.